Hey guys, Steve here from Boss Bronx Suspension and Whistler. Welcome to the Tuesday Tune. This week we're going to spend some time addressing the concept of a correct setup. This is something that is frequently brought up with us uh, by customers and people just asking advice. How do I know when my suspension is set up correctly? Now, the implication of using the word correct in the first place is somewhat misleading because there isn't really a correct setup per se. So what we're going to go through instead is some ways that you can look at the performance of your suspension and understand how it's performing relative to what you want. Because ultimately how correct the suspension setup is, is determined entirely by the rider, the owner of the bike. If the suspension is doing what you want it to do, it's set up correctly. If it's not doing what you want it to do, it's not set up correctly. Obviously, there are realistic limitations and compromises that have to be made. Uh, you can't have you know, a very short travel bike that absorbs bumps like a downhill bike and also doesn't bottom out too easily. So the first question I like to ask is, is it sufficiently compliant? Is it harsh? Is it able to move out of the way of bumps when you need it to? Is it able to respond quickly enough, essentially, with low enough friction, uh, with you know appropriate rates of damping and whatnot, is it actually reducing the harshness that's coming through to your body? If you're able to hold on, you find the ride comfortable, essentially the answer to that is yes. If you're not, first thing to check is tire pressure. Tire pressure has a huge influence on this. Run it as low as you can without causing adverse effects in terms of flatting too often, burping tubeless, damaging rims, uh, tires rolling sideways in corners and so forth. There's no real advantage to running a higher tire pressure than you need to on a mountain bike anyway. Second question is, is it sufficiently supportive? Do I feel like I have something to push against? Is it disappearing from under me when I'm riding steep stuff or rough stuff? Or is it holding me up and inspiring confidence? If you can answer yes to that, excellent. That is the second one ticked off the list. Third, can I use the full travel effectively? Now, this is not saying can I use full travel every time I ride it, all the time, am I bottoming it out once a run, whatever, no. What it's saying is, when I hit it hard enough, something that I can hold on to, is it using full travel or is it not? Is it using full travel too easily? Is it bottoming out too easily? That is what you want to look at there. That's probably the easiest one to address out of all of these because it's very easy to increase your spring rate or decrease your spring rate uh, to make sure that you are using full travel or alternatively, to make sure that you're not bottoming out too frequently if that is a problem that you're currently having. So that one, probably the easiest one of the lot to address. Fourth question, does the wheel track the ground well? Is it following the ground, is my wheel doing what it can to follow the terrain and give me grip and also, funnily enough, increase compliance? The more the wheel stays on the ground, the less impacts you have. So the more that it's able to basically roll over obstacles rather than bounce into them, obviously the less harshness you get, the better the compliance. So that one is pretty important. Fifth question, does it feel stable and predictable? Generally speaking, the best indicator of this is, does it scare the shit out of me when I try to jump it? If the answer is no, either you're a great rider and able to compensate for a terribly set up bike, or more likely your bike is actually quite predictable, relatively safe. Now, this is always a very personal thing. I've seen two riders on identical bikes, both very, very good riders, World Cup level guys. Identical bike, identical suspension, completely different setups. One of them very conventional, one of them quite unorthodox. One of them I would have said was a death trap to jump. This guy clearly did not agree. He was more than capable of jumping that. Very personal, that one. Number six, is it sufficiently lively and playful? Now this contrasts with stability predictability to a certain degree. If you deaden the bike too much to make it stable and predictable, you can go so far that basically the thing will never want to leave the ground, uh, it won't be very responsive, it will tend to feel very dead. Again, very personal preference as to where on that spectrum you like to sit. If you want something that is super planted at the expense of all else, uh, something that's particularly fast for example, then you need to look at you know, increasing your stability. If you want something to go and play around on the bike park and you're not necessarily trying to go super fast or you're not super worried about it being 
the most planted thing in the world. Obviously, the liveliness and the fun factor is really gonna play into that more than having something that is more stable than it needs to be for you. And so on that note, we also have obviously very different requirements according to the type of riding that you're doing. If you're racing, of course, your main priority is speed if you're a serious racer. Likewise, if you're just going to the bike park with your friends and dicking around a bit and jumping off stuff all the time, you don't have the same requirements. Your priority is gonna be very different you're probably looking for something that's more playful, more fun, not necessarily as fast. So obviously there are some contradictory elements here that are gonna induce compromise in some form. So getting the best compliance typically involves running a soft setup, relatively light damping and so forth. However, getting something that is very supportive is usually a much firmer setup. So for example, you may well find that in order to get the compliance that you want, getting the support that you want is difficult and vice versa. So basically, if you can answer yes to these six questions, honestly, then your suspension is set up better for you than most people's is. And that puts you in a pretty good position. If you have sufficient compliance, sufficient support, you're able to use full travel when necessary, the wheel is following the ground well, it feels stable and predictable and not to such an extent that you're losing the liveliness or playfulness, then you have a very good setup. That isn't necessarily something that everyone will always manage to achieve. And this is basically our criteria uh, when we set up suspension for people or do custom valving for people. These are the criteria that we're looking to fulfill to give you a yes answer to each of these questions. So let's have a bit of a look at assessing compromise in your setup as well. Now, this is paraphrased from Paul Theed's excellent book, uh, The Race Tech Motorcycle Suspension Bible. Now, this is a graphical depiction of performance as measured by you in whatever terms you like, not a specific uh, quantifiable measure. As compared to any of your adjustment settings. Now, let's say this is adjuster A, whichever that may be, it might be rebound, it might be high speed compression, it might be low speed compression, it might be spring rate. So we have at one end of the spectrum, like the slowest or firmest setup, the most heavily damped, the most firmest, uh, the firmest, whichever it may be. And at the other end of the spectrum, the fastest uh, or the softest, the most open, free moving setup. If we were to categorize performance, between bad, okay, and great, then each of these curves basically will represent uh, where in the adjuster range you get the best performance for a different parameter that you are tuning for. For example, you might find that the best support and predictability um, platform is coming from this blue curve here, so towards the slower and firmer end of your adjustment spectrum. You may find you go too far with that, it actually feels worse. So where that will work best may be in between this position on your adjustment and this position. The red one, however, representing bump compliance and traction may be further in this direction. So what happens if we graph this sort of performance curve is that you find that there is basically a usable range where everything works quite well. You may find that you get great traction in between these two points. And likewise, you may find you get great support in between these two points here. What you ideally want to do then is make sure that you are essentially using this as a Venn diagram and finding the overlap. And that means finding the position in that range of adjustment where both of those characteristics are satisfied as well as they can be. Now, what you may also find is that there are times when in reality, you have a curve that instead of this red one, it's way out there. And that means that the best that you're really gonna get is where these two curves here intersect because the highest performance points might be completely separate from each other. And that is when we really start to see compromise appearing in terms of setup. For example, with spring rate, if you have a particularly linear spring rate at the shock uh, on a particularly linear frame and you are racing downhill at a World Cup level, you may find that where you get the 
appropriate levels of support and bottom out resistance measured by the blue curve does not line up with where you get the best traction and compliance measured by the green curve. Those might be quite a long way apart. And that is when we have to start looking at making more fundamental changes to your suspension uh, than simply playing with that adjustment. That may mean revalving, it may mean a completely different spring curve, it may mean you need a different leverage rate curve, which is obviously getting to the point of a new frame or very serious modifications. So I hope that's helped shed some light on the idea of a correct setup, the myth of a correct setup, as it were. I don't believe there is any such thing as a correct setup. There is no mathematical, quantifiable way to provide that. And therefore, it's quite a misleading concept for a lot of people. This is where I would say to people, trust your own perception. If something feels good to you, it's good. If it feels bad, let's see what we can do to fix it. There is, of course, the saying, again, from Race Tech, the best you've ridden is the best you know. However, what you feel overrides everything. If you feel it's good, it's good. If you feel it's bad, it's bad. What is really helpful uh, from my end and from the end of anyone else that you may be getting to junior suspension is being very specific with your requirements. Specific problems have specific solutions. Vague problems usually don't have a solution at all. And that means things like my suspension feels bad, it's very hard for us to simply crank up the suspension feeling good adjuster. However, if you say my suspension feels harsh on small bumps, okay, then we know where to start. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to know the technical ins and outs of it. If you come to us with specific problems like that, we can give you specific solutions. And so I'm going to wrap up on that note for this week, guys. Until next week, I'll see you then.